This is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Fetessy. I'm Bridget Fetessy, and you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. This week, our sponsor is M.M. Lafleur. M.M. Lafleur is a wardrobe solution for professional women. It creates luxury apparel and accessories with the same attention to detail as high-end fashion houses. Right now, if you visit mmlafleur.com slash walkin and use promo code walkin, you'll get 15% off your first purchase. That's mmlafleur.com slash walkin and you can get 15% off your first purchase with promo code walkin. This week, we're excited to have Paul Shirley. He's a former Iowa State University and professional basketball player. He's also a writer. His first book, Can I Keep My Jersey, was about his time as a professional athlete. And his second book, Stories I Tell on Dates, is pretty self-explanatory. It's also a podcast now. Paul also founded Writer's Block. It's a communal workspace specifically for writers. Paul has a lot of experience with discipline, focus, and overcoming the internal resistance. So I thought he would be a great guest to have. So Paul Shirley, a repeat walk-ins. Welcome guest. I'm so happy to be a two-timer. You are you, one of the few. Yeah, since uh, since you started this thing. I think I was... Um, you were like, like second. First, yeah. Just, yeah, like right in there. <laughs> I think you were way and then early. It's, uh, it's gotten really big. You've done well. Congratulations. Thank you. It's I, I love it. It's a labor of love still, but mm-hmm. we have sponsored... I mean, it's not you know paying my bills, but it's definitely... It it's so funny how when you create something and then it saves you, right? You know, it, yeah. it's one of those things that I even yours recently. I don't listen to my podcast because I can't stand the sound of my own voice. Mm-hmm. But now that we have all of this leisure time, and I was thinking like, oh, I need to be more disciplined. And I always think of our podcast because we talked so much about self discipline, particularly. Mm-hmm. And then now I was like, oh, you're great to have back on because this In is this kind time. of your wheelhouse. Yeah, what a what a world we've so tell stumbled us, into. So tell us about where you're at with work right now. You started Writer's Block, which I kind of refer to lovingly as my writer's gem. Right. And don't go enough, like <laughs> like many people with gems. Mm-hmm. And but a lot of it is because of commuting in LA. Right. It took me nine minutes to get to yeah. here today, which is miraculous. Yeah. Yeah. Um yeah, the the short <laughs> history for anyone who doesn't know which is most everyone um i played professional basketball for a long time Mm -hmm. um also stumbled my way into a writing career had something of a come to jesus moment with myself where i realized i wasn't treating writing like i had basketball okay interesting i needed to figure out how do i as stephen pressfield who wrote that book the war of art Mm -hmm. um great book yeah uh as he writes like in that at some point you have to decide you're going to turn pro and that doesn't mean you're going to get paid for what you're doing i would say that i turned pro as a basketball player when i was like 16 right again doesn't mean i was getting paid but it was like when i flipped that switch to like oh if i'm going to get really good at this i'm going to have to treat it as a sacred pursuit and so i i figured out that my writing for a long time, was just like, oh, I'm kind of a smart, clever basketball player, and I can get away with that. And that only lasted so long. Right. And then I needed to get really serious about it. So in that process, started Writer's Block, which is spelled with a K instead of a CK, mm-hmm. um, which is it honestly it was built that way on purpose because our logo is this little child's block. Uh-huh. And I wanted it to evoke that image of discovery and it being as... Um, accessible as possible because I think anything creative needs to be not intimidating to people. It is such a great space. I love the space, that physical space. Yeah, which wasn't, I mean, at first we did that as a, it was a pop-up in other people's spaces. And then about two years ago got a permanent space. Yeah, it's so, it's so bright and it does make, I do, I did get a lot done when I would go there and, but that's the case even for me here. It's really just being able to focus Mm -hmm. like a timer is everything for me. Yeah. And then, and that, uh, we will, we will dive more into this, but we've, we've taken 
what we're doing in the physical space to an online service that uh, hosts online sprints all through the day. That's awesome. Each of them last an hour. There's 50 minutes of writing. When you get there, we have you log in a goal and then afterwards have you log what you accomplished. And then there's an element of talk, getting you talking to other writers about what you're doing and how that's going and what you wore while you were writing today. Wow. Um, it's, it's, it's really it's we're fortunate because we started experimenting with this like six months ago mm-hmm. and then this chaos all hit and yeah so we've now needed to just ramp up very quickly um and so far it seems to be going pretty well so what do you think are the biggest what have you lost the most in going virtual so for me if I'm thinking about my writing career, I need to get out of the house mm. to work effectively because okay. I think there's there's also all the evidence that would say that like if you want to create that delineation between like I'm at home and I'm at work. Mm-hmm. Now, for some people, that's it's enough to go to another room, right? right? For me, that doesn't really work. I have a roommate and mm-hmm. nothing against him. It's just that I don't have a place that I can go. And I've also just kind of flipped the switch into my head where – it helps me to get in my car and go to a physical right. place in the same way that I'm a uh, an ex-professional athlete. You right. would think that I could work out at home, but there's no chance of that happening. I need to go to the gym and make that commitment to, I've gone to a separate location <laughs> right, right. And, I, and here's where I work it's out. It's an effort. Yeah, it's. I think once you've made that commitment, it's just easier than once yeah. you've gotten there to actually follow through. What is that whole thing? 99% is showing up. Yeah. I mean, it is, it <laughs> is silly. I was actually, so I'm, I'm right now working on the rough draft of a book about productivity and habit, which, you know, there's a million of those yeah. and I kind of am hesitant to even <laughs> write it, but I've learned so much about what carries over from sports to the creative pursuits that I think it's worth at least getting it all down well and i imagine you've learned a lot from working with other people and hearing their struggles and hearing what works right. for them yeah being because able now to, you have all this anecdotal evidence from the yeah, hundreds just, of people yeah having had to say it a one zillion times right helps right. to kind of distill that in your brain and i was talking today or writing today about how i would say that it it matters somewhat how much you write right like 60 minutes is better than 10 minutes mm-hmm but it's not six times as good because what matters really is that you sat down and opened up your laptop and just kind of reconnected with it for the day. So that's that showing up that you were talking about, right? right? Like that 10 minutes is not, you know, it's not just a tiny bit better than zero. It's a lot better than zero. And then the 60 minutes is, is better than than the 10 minutes, but it's not that much better. It's more about like, just, I looked at what I was working on today and that helps me get to the next day. And I find that, I sometimes when I don't want to show up at all, mm-hmm. if I say just do 10 minutes, that's mm-hmm. enough to do 60. So right. just sitting down and saying, I only have to write for 10 minutes will be enough for me to be like, okay, and now I'm here for an hour because I got into it. Yeah, true. Although I always push people on that a little bit because I think we make deals with our brains mm-hmm. and that if you start welshing on those deals then your brain starts to be like fuck you man i'm not doing that yesterday you said it was only 10 minutes and then it turned into 60 so what's actually better is to say you know what this week this week is too much chaos so i'm only going to do 10 minutes a day and so you only expect 10 minutes and then you also stop yourself at that 10 minute mark so that you know tomorrow when you sit down like it really and truly is only well generally what happens with me is that it's not something that I have to force myself to do the other 50 minutes. Mm. So for me, it's getting myself there to the 10 minutes. And then if I want to finish after 10 minutes, I did 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. But usually what I find is I'll get in and do 10 minutes and then I'll want to, I'll just keep writing. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I very rarely have to, like my brain isn't really reacting when I say let's only do 10 minutes because it usually once I'm actually in the process, mm-hmm. it's like getting to the gym. Right. Once I'm there and in a class, you just do the class, even if yeah. you're resisting it well, the whole time. I think that is. I think it's kind of important to think of it then as a two-step process, right. right? So, like, if I can just get sat down and know going into your week or your month or whatever what your goal is, right, right for each day, and making that the same every day, right, so that it, you can commit to it. That that seems to not only have worked throughout my life, but also seems to be what most people who talk about this 
say, right? Yeah. Like that if you want to build this habit, it needs to be repeatable and also similar every day. And that you have to learn how to forgive yourself as yeah. well. You know, like if you have a bad day, you set that up at the beginning of the day. Like, well, shit, I only got four hours of sleep last night. I'm not going to be at the top of my game. So I'm changing my goal from an hour to 20 minutes. But I know that going in as opposed to sitting down, hoping you're going to get an hour and then quitting after 20 minutes. Right, That's right. a very different mentality because you give yourself that win, which right. is, you know what? I'm I'm not doing great today, but I did manage to get exactly the 20 minutes that I hoped I would set out to get. <laughs> but see, I'll trick myself with stuff like that because I'll be like, I did 20 minutes, man. <laughs> like, that's good enough. Right. And, then, and then I feel like sometimes it's a way of selling myself short. And I'm massively undisciplined. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, it is embarrassing all across the board. And so, and being weirdly in recovery and alcoholic, like I always joke that the f- messed up thing about recovery is that you win every day you don't do something. You're oh, like, right. I didn't do this today. And that <laughs> they're like, well, every day you stay sober, it's a win. Right, like, right. That means I can win every day by literally not doing something. Mm-hmm. But do you think so? You said you're undisciplined. Do you actually think you're undisciplined, or have you learned to be self deprecating and to say that? No, I'm undisciplined. Really? It, what, how does that manifest for you? I cannot. So it's a blessing and a curse. Mm-hmm. So I can write anywhere. I mm-hmm. can write in bed naked. I can write on my couch. I can write in a basement in Dublin. That's where I wrote my first Playboy column that was in print mm-hmm. because I was on the road and got asked to do it. So there is a gift in that I've been oh when, when I I write, can write on the road I can I write really well on planes because there isn't much of a distraction mm-hmm. and I don't have but because I'm not such a slave to that routine mm-hmm. I have the flexibility to just write whenever and wherever however I probably would be much more productive if I had a very set routine every day with my writing which I've wanted to have for my entire life and mm. I don't. I'm just so undisciplined about it. So I I mean that resonates because again, I went through that same process when my basketball career was done. <laughs> and I'm a professional writer, by the way. Like, I, I get paid I, for this. I had um I had a column with ESPN where I would write about music and I had a column in a Spanish newspaper called El País about the NBA. Mm-hmm. And so and at the time I was also working on a book. But I just had oceans of time mm-hmm. right and was maddeningly undisciplined mm-hmm. and so what i have found is that the only thing that works for me is to make sure that i'm really busy like i will get more books written in this time that i'm also running two businesses right than i would have back then when i had so much time well it's hands. like that and i'm busy too i have this podcast i have a show that mm-hmm. youtube show that takes all weekend right and so my therapist will push back and she's like you do a podcast every week for over a year you do mm-hmm. um a weekly show that takes all weekend to write and film and edit and get up and So there are areas where I'm disciplined. But when it comes to like my book proposal, I've wanted to write a book proposal for like three. It's been on my goals for three years. I'm like, what is my fucking problem? I have editors and agents who want me to write a book. It's embarrassing. So what I've found, and again, (laughs) this comes from personal experience. Do you really want to do it? No, I do. I do. It's just that. I don't because I think that's the that's the thing that tips us all over is that we have to hit this rock bottom. For me, the rock bottom came when I had written a novel that was not very good, mm-hmm. and someone finally told me this is not very good, mm-hmm. and I had to realize like, oh shit, I'm a charlatan, right? right. And then that's where, but I feel I that like, way anyway. <laughs> you're just like at a baseline level. That's of my baseline. Yeah, memory. I'm like, why is anyone? Well, so for yeah, for me, it was like I am bullshitting myself, right? And that there's also this awareness of like left to its own devices, my brain would also completely spin out. Mm-hmm. People are who are around me, especially at writers, but like are like, wow, you seem so disciplined, and I I am, but that's because I have to be, right? Or nothing would ever get done, right, right? Right. I think that's an interesting, like, misconception. I think like a lot of us who need self discipline are also prone to 
it could go real sideways right. real quick. <laughs> right. Right. And my level of, of, um, you know, I'm undisciplined and that was a weird thing when I got sober because I was very OCD and mm. my therapist was like, you've got to lean off the OCD because when I was in rehab at 19, mm -hmm. they told me that cluttered room, cluttered mind. And it was basically like a symptom of my alcoholism and addiction. So from, 19 or 20 when I got sober that time and then I went back out I chose to go back out I'm like I'm not an alcoholic mm -hmm. and to 35 I was like well if my life is in order I don't have a problem so mm -hmm. it became this weird way of me tricking myself so then I had to let that go a little and loosen up and then I felt like it got it's just I feel like this time in particular with the coronavirus and the quarantine it's like never before has the battle against ourself been so apparent. Yeah, no, I, I mean, <laughs> I, even I, again, pretty uh, self-disciplined and also talk and write about this a lot. Mm -hmm. I've noticed that I have more time than I thought I did. And I think I was cluttering up my life. I wonder, mm -hmm. and this is a, a deeper topic, but I think we're, we're all so disconnected from fulfillment within our lives mm. that we speed up and we create all this chaos to avoid having to think about the fact that we don't have that fulfillment. Right. Right. So do you know this story of after Tolstoy had written Anna Karenina and war and peace, he wanted to kill himself. Right. <laughs> can, he's like, I can understand that. <laughs> he's like, I'm, I'm everything I ever wanted to be. I'm this, the most celebrated <laughs> author in Russia and I get to go to parties mm. and, to do all of the things that I, I wanted to do, why do I want to be dead? Mm. And so he wrote a an like a memoir autobiography about how he had come to the realization that he had too much time on his hands mm. and he wasn't tired enough and that the only person who had it figured out was the wood chopper. Right. The wood chopper goes out in the morning, his wife, whatever, makes him the eggs and he goes out and chops the wood. He exhausted. comes home, he's exhausted, he's happy because he gets to see his wife and his kids and he has a place to rest and he doesn't have that time to think about like, well, what does it all mean? Right, right. right. So like we, the problem I think is we don't know what it all means and our brains can't grasp it. And so historically we were just like, well, we'll go build a fence right. and that'll take my brain off of it. And in a time like this, we're all forced to sit with, oh shit, all of this stuff I was filling my day up Chasing. wasn't really oh, I fulfilling know. and it didn't really connect me. So how do I actually connect? oh shit, that's a big task. Mm -hmm. And how do I actually find some meaning within this time that I'm having? Well, it's the baking bread thing. Mm -hmm. So I, this is a gluten-free town primarily. <laughs> and I suddenly felt this instinct that apparently everybody felt to mm -hmm. bake bread. Oh, And yeah. I've never, because I agree, Scott Adams, I think said, if you come out of on the other side of this without a new skill, you've wasted this time, mm -hmm. which no one's coming out of this right. with a new it's skill. <laughs> it's harsh, <laughs> harsh, but true. Maybe. Harsh, but true. So right. I was like, I've always wanted to learn how to bake bread and it seems intimidating. And then I went down this rabbit hole of the history of bread baking. Oh, wow. And it's crazy. And I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, this is in my DNA, mm -hmm. like primal DNA. Mm -hmm. I got this. And I made my first loaf of rosemary bread and it came out amazing first mm -hmm. try. And mm -hmm. it was, but I could not find any, there was no flour anywhere <laughs> in all of LA. You mean just because of the gluten free part or because everybody No, had hoarded because it. everybody went out and wanted to make bread. Um, it's yeah. like some weird primal thing. Right. And then no yeast anywhere. And right. now I've got like a self, a starter from a sourdough starter from San Francisco. Like I'm in, in the oh, rabbit hole. Like a, like a speakeasy starter. Like you had to go to some <laughs> yeah, basement but it's, door. No, I got it on like eBay from someone in San Francisco. It's like, it's like 140 year old <laughs> something. Right. And we, it, it's a weird, um, but to your point of that looking for meaning and mm -hmm. what is this, what do we do with this time? And cooking for me is always something that grounds me just in general. Mm -hmm. It's my brain. I have a lot of uh, scatteredness to it. And with social media, like you and I were talking before we started recording, you can go on these massive rabbit holes that agitate that, oh, yeah. that spin out. Right. And so cooking has always been just a good way of like, it requires steps, mm -hmm. you know, baking in particular is so scientific. So it's, you have to actually really pay attention. And it's just soothing in this time, I feel of 
I can't control anything. You know, like it's, I don't think we fully yeah. understand well, how yeah, insane this is. We, we, I think we also probably have lost sight of the fragility of life mm -hmm. because we are so insulated and, and as we progress, quote, as a society and, and organism, we insulate ourselves from tragedy more and more, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so if it were a hundred years ago, our life expectancies would be a lot shorter and that we would just be around people who are losing limbs or dying right, of right. rickets or whatever right. else. And Diphtheria now, for the most part, like, especially if you're in, if you have enough resources to post on Instagram once every two days, that's a pretty good indicator that your life is pretty good. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and so I think something like this is also really jarring because you're like, oh, whoa, I'm not as invincible as I thought. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing I can really, I mean, there are things that we can all do to keep ourselves healthy in a general sense. I, speaking of Instagram, just posted the other day that a couple of days ago um, was the 16th anniversary of when I almost died from having my kidney and spleen ruptured while playing for the Chicago Bulls. Oh, wow. And that, of course, changed my perspective mm -hmm. significantly, right? Mm -hmm. So like it, my life, I, it opened up to me the importance of experiencing as many things as I could while I'm still alive. Because mm -hmm. I was 20, oh, 24, 25, wow. right? And was by all reasonable measures, basically indestructible. Mm -hmm. I was six foot nine, mm -hmm. 230 pound man with a 30 inch vertical who could bench press 300 pounds. Yeah. Right? Like, like if you looked at me, I was basically like a Goliath. Right. In biblical time. <laughs> right. And then all of a sudden I was laid low by this knee to the side that exploded my internal organs. Um. And then on an airplane from Indiana, cause we've been playing the Indiana or the Indiana Pacers. Yeah. Uh, to Chicago, my retroperitoneal cavity was filling up with blood and the trainer was looking at me and I could see in his eyes like, oh, I might die now. Yeah, right? yeah. So anyway, that has really also hooked me up in at, a, at a, an important time in my life with how we can't control everything. Right. And so it sometimes is hard for me to see that, oh, these people aren't hyper aware of the fact that they could just be gone at any moment. I happen to be blessed with this experience which changed me right and helps me understand like yeah life sucks yeah for a lot of people yeah. and it can start sucking real fast yeah at any moment yeah that right? was one of the things that interviewing the holocaust survivor recently i just mm -hmm. keep thinking about how you know my sister's like well like you know it was the worst day ever or something and we're like it can always get worse yeah. <laughs> that was something that was so i just it's they kept thinking there was a bottom and mm -hmm. it's like there was no bottom right you know, the pe there's always like, oh, there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. I'm like, no, we don't hear from the people that's not true for because they're dead. Right. <laughs> you yeah. know? <laughs> yeah, I, I do wonder. So like in tying all of this in a not very neat bow, the fact that we're so disconnected from purpose, not, mm -hmm. not all of us, of course. There are a lot mm -hmm. of people listening who I would hope have a ton of purpose in their lives. But for a lot of people who maybe don't, who don't feel connected to the day-to-day -day of like, I produce this and then I sell it for that and then somebody's happy with it, right? If you just go to work at um, an ad agency mm -hmm. and you're like, I'm just a cog in this wheel that makes commercials for Toyota, I don't really care. I think that leads to, like we were saying earlier, the sense that you just have to fill things, fill your life with like activities and right. purchases and whatever right, else. Right. And then that all of a sudden is taken away from you. Mm -hmm. And now you're faced with like, oh shit, now the only thing I have going for me is posting pushups on Instagram. Right. Like this <laughs> is brutal. This, it's also just so much of a insight into, this is the first time I've really sat down and talked with anyone about this actually, what's going on. But it's also just been such an insight into the freedoms. And I was joking on the dumpster fire show I do. I'm like, you know, I'm someone who's like trying to get out of everything I get invited to. I don't have that many friends, so I don't have to go to birthday parties. Mm -hmm. And the minute you tell me I can't go out, I'm like, I want to go clubbing. Like, I haven't <laughs> right. been to a club right. since I was 20. And oh, I know. Yeah. I'm yeah, like, that's... I need to go out now. Right. And it's like that contrarian instinct to just be like, why don't we get a whole group together and go to the beach? It's not some game night sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it's not something I'd ever want to do. Yeah, that is, it is. It is interesting. I mean, it's, I wonder if some of that too is like evolutionary in that when you dark, when you start to see like 
death up close, you do start to connect to the things that mm. matter to you. And we all care about, you know, human connection, no matter what we say, mm-hmm. right? So there might be something primal in that too of like, well, if this is going to be the end, then let's go out swinging. Well, right? that's been the tough thing with being sober in this time too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there are many things that are tough about being sober at this time. Well, um, I mean, aside from everyone posting their apocalyptic stashes of booze Mm -hmm. on every thread that I'm on and everywhere, there's just that nihilism in my brain of Um, like, oh, if this is the end. And I thought I've talked about this before because it's my big fear of going down in a plane Mm -hmm. is that my last thought is going to be like, and you really couldn't have had that Jack Daniels. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. well, that would have been since you know we were talking. I was telling you the story about my near death. I didn't drink until I was twenty seven, mm. like long after this experience, right? And didn't really go out, didn't do much at all because I was ho- so focused on my basketball career mm-hmm. at the time. And I, I bet I don't think I had time to think about it because I was in so much pain. But I would have been sad that I hadn't had some experiences, right? Like yeah. we're we do also do we live like there's evidence that people now have fewer sexual partners than the generation before them. Yeah, there's a lot of evidence. I feel like there's these weird, there's this bifurcation of people who like party constantly and then there's this very kind of puritanical thing we've kind of taken on Yeah, a little bit, right? Yeah, there's, well, I just think it's technology. I Mm -hmm. I mean, they're saying like the younger generation, they're so much better because they don't drink and they don't smoke cigarettes and they don't have sex young and I'm like, that's because they're addicted to their phones. Yeah. So I'm... (laughs) I don't I I don't think it's some weird like they're more evolved. I think they just have a different way to express themselves. Yeah, there must be you were talking about like the desire to drink or be debaucherous as you see like the end coming. I do think that like <laughs> it's as, like that as, scene in <laughs> Matrix 2 or whatever where they're all like right. in that like orgy party uh-huh. or the <laughs> like the night before the last battle in um game of thrones oh yeah like yeah, yeah. Getting hammered exactly banging. exactly um i do think that like that's in another thing that is that is true now is like we have so much information and we think so much we start to think that we can outthink ourselves out of any situation mm. there's a reason people have been drinking booze and banging forever and things get chaotic yeah. because we're like we're not that evolved we're pretty evolved but at our core we're <laughs> scared and we're fragile and we don't know what to do right right, right. and i think that could also be a, a good way to respond to all inflammatory tweets right now is like we're scared we're fragile and we don't know what to do right so like because everybody's just trying to come up with certainty one thing i've been thinking about is like it's with especially because of cognitive dissonance it's really easy to decide i think it's going to go this way with something like this pandemic where at the time that you and i are recording this we don't know which way it's going to go mm-hmm. that's the the truth is like nobody knows and it's really easy to start to think like well my side is the side of this or my side mm-hmm. is the side of that and then it's difficult to see evidence that dissuades you from that because you've picked a side right that you've made it calm in your brain right which again this is not either of our area of expertise but we've heard a lot of people talk about cognitive dissonance and how destructive it can be and i think that's what's what goes on is this sense of i'm scared and i'm fragile i just want somebody to tell me that this is the answer right i will commit to that and now i don't have to think about it anymore and now i'm going to just get mad at anybody who disagrees with me well this is why this happening to our country at this particular moment has been in some ways I was saying like the other night I felt like I was going crazy and on mm-hmm. fetacy.com my little community it's primarily people because I very openly identify as politically homeless it's people who identify that way as well but in this moment being politically homeless and not in a tribe where the tribes seem to have divvied up into (laughs) economics and we're all gonna die Mm -hmm. um which is unfortunate but again just because of where this landed in our country and who's in charge and all of these other factors that we're already simmering Mm -hmm. people who i have the benefit i feel of seeing a lot more of it because mm-hmm. I wasn't committed, but it also makes me feel insane. Right. So I'm like, why can't I just believe, you know, like this is the right way and put my mind at ease and not be taking in all of this information because I'm in in that center. Like mm-hmm. I see people who are in a lane and I envy that certainty that they are right. they've this bomb they've given to their mind. And I have to be careful because 
part of what I've recognized about why I even became kind of politically homeless is that being reasonable is a way for me to calm myself down. Mm -hmm. So in the face of completely normal feelings of fear or anxiety or panic that actually might be reasonable, Mm -hmm. I will be like both sides in it, you know? (laughs) So I have to be careful of, of reason being something that it's like, don't, I was laughing because people have been so outraged about like Marvel versus D. We've been in a culture of outrage and now everyone's like, hey, calm down. I'm like, this might be the time mm-hmm. to use that outrage. Right. <laughs> but we've been kind of so, crying wolf. So would that so you're so that's sort of like a self soothing mechanism. Reason? Yeah. Well, I think that it's a defense against I I don't trust a lot of it comes from my background a lot of it comes from I don't being an, an addict I don't necessarily trust myself mm. and all in many different ways but I certainly don't trust my emotions. Right. So even if there's some truth to the emotions mm. I will try and and be like, well, why am I feeling this way? Why is this button being pushed? Mm. What is my part in this? And then try and reason myself I was talking about how I witnessed a shooting last week on the podcast and how quickly I noticed I was able to be present for my brain lying to me Mm. in a moment where I saw something happen and my brain was like, this didn't happen. This isn't, this wasn't a shooting. This, you know, it was kids playing cap guns and it turned out it was, but it Mm. was amazing to me how quickly that denial took place. Mm. And you see this all the time with Holocaust survivor stories people who were offered tickets to get out. And so in this weird moment, I have to be careful that I'm not trying to, you know, that denial is not being masked as, is not like disguised as reason. Right. So how do I, I mean, well, so probably one would have to think that, you know, you and I are aged enough. We're not as old and as experienced and as wise as someday we will be, but we've also probably been exposed to a lot of therapy Mm-hmm. A lot of training to question emotion as, is this helpful to me or harmful to me, mm-hmm. right? So that may also be, because cha- I'm the same way, right? Like I will always look at it through a, the lens of like, what's really, what's what are the facts here? Don't don't be the person who flies off the handle because there are plenty of those around. Right. Be the person who can be stable right. in this moment. But you were saying too that, at the beginning before when we started recording you know you have to kind of check where you're starting like what's your skin in the game right what what do you can you elaborate on that oh well so we we were talking you and i were talking about like if we get into the debate of like economics versus <laughs> right right versus right like uh like how let people public die health whatever, yeah right? <laughs> Um, so it, I mean, something like this is, is particular hits close to home because one of my brothers is an infectious disease doctor, which I don't want to dwell on. For no, no, long, no. Mostly because but I don't want to misquote him. Yeah, right? yeah. I don't want to have him. <laughs> people are like, what? Your brother said this. I don't want to be Roger Clinton to his, is it Roger Clinton to Bill Clinton? Was that, was Roger Clinton the problem child? I think so. Okay. And then my mom is an RN with a master's in public health. So like I've been kind of more aware of information for longer i also now run a business that is in los angeles where we've been told like you can't have a business open Uh however the online stuff that we're doing is really popular right Uh now right so i've had to think about like well am i mad about businesses being closed because of my business specifically Mm -hmm. at first yes but also then probably this is more helpful to my business in the long run Mm because it has caused us to ramp up and be more available all over the world Mm -hmm. we have a guy right now who's in a session i saw just before this in london yeah like that makes us much more scalable Mm -hmm. and this is something we've actually been working on for like six months Mm -hmm. so it's probably good for my business i think my response probably has more to do with like i have so many friends who are in the service industry like in Mm -hmm. coffee shops and bars and restaurants Mm -hmm. and very few people think about what happens to them in a situation like i mean i know you do (laughs) but a lot of people on either side Right. right Like if you just are a teacher, you're probably just going to get paid for the rest of the year. Right, right. And you're not really thinking about like, well, you're like, well, yeah, this sucks. But like there's a lot of people who are just working 
for their wages, yeah. right? And then there are also those And they have owners, to go to work. Right, and there are these owners of bars and restaurants who are like, what am I supposed to do? Right. I don't want to not pay these workers, but right. like, where am I going to come up with this money? So I think as a, as in the cohort of small business owner, even though it's not specifically going to be a killer to my business, I'm very much more aware of that than I might have been when I was a kid or if I had gone into a different job. Right. Um, when I think about now professional sports being shut down, I actually don't think of it in terms of the athletes because they'll, of course, be fine. It's more about like there are hundreds and sometimes thousands of people who are dependent on not just cleaning up the stadium, but also the bar and restaurant that's right. next to the stadium. Like all of right. this stuff Parking, is happening. Attendant. Right? I know so and much. So that hits me in a way that makes me want to say like, well, now let's find a middle ground here <laughs> right. because, you know, we want to be sympathetic to anyone who's got a disease, but we also need to be sympathetic to the eight year old who's about to have six months of his schooling cut out. And there's lots of evidence that that's not the time you want to be cutting out schooling on an eight year old or that their parents can't afford to have like, yeah, that there's, there's a lot of sides and that usually reason is the best place to start totally. as opposed to let's fly off the handle. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I would say too that like, and we maybe talked about this the first time I was on, I think in the absence of religion that, these sides become people's religion. Totally. So like if it were 200 years ago, everybody would be going to church right now. Yeah. Like, virus be damned because they're like, I got to find a, a way through this. And people are still doing this. Well, but I think by the way. some of them are, but a lot more of them, their church is Instagram. Right. And so the, the gospel is of either the left wing or the right wing instead right. of maybe like, let's, let's let go and let God. Jonah Goldberg and I talked a lot about this, how, in the absence of in real life religion, churches and stuff like that, it becomes this ideology, right. which is insane and dangerous. But yeah, well, the, I mean, <laughs> churches were insane and dangerous, but at least they but were localized. They were, right, right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think now there is the, um, I would guess, I don't know. I, I, I don't want to give too much credit to religion, but I think for a lot of religious people, there is the ability to keep it as like, well, look, this is something that helps me get through the day there's a self-righteousness that can come into politics or policy where people are like no this is the answer mm -hmm. that it becomes culty instead mm -hmm. of religion like yeah one today we had uh, some recovery online and it was so much of a relief but i do i've been feeling squirrely because i haven't been partaking enough in that and mm -hmm. it was just great to hear everybody else sharing about how they actually feel very prepared for this because of all the tools they have oh, from yeah. recovery. Right. And I was like, oh yeah, I guess I should be using some of those tools. And I, and one person, there's this kind of, there are just lots of, you know, the, the platitudes that get repeated a lot, but one is clean house, trust God, be of service. Mm -hmm. And you know, like one day at a time, that's just like the mantra, especially in early sobriety mm -hmm. when you're just trying to like right, just stay like, sober that day or mm -hmm. that hour. And it is very back to basics in that sense because mm. there's not really much else I can do. Right. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. M.M. LaFleur was founded on the idea that when women succeed in the workplace, the world becomes a better place. If you hate shopping for work clothes like me, I hate shopping for work clothes, then M.M. is the perfect place to start. I discovered this company and love it. You can shop their website a la carte or browse their pre-styled capsule wardrobes. And I need that kind of inspiration because I am not a fashionista. And as I mentioned, I hate shopping, but it's mostly just because I hate clothes. And M.M. Lafleur is great for somebody like me who just really cannot stand the entire process. Or you can go to one of their showrooms in seven cities across America where they'll actually help you. And... I need all the help I can get. Everything is very stylish and it can easily segue from a podcast interview to a meeting and back to a dinner. It's classy and classic and it will hold up. The quality is amazing. I love their blazer that I got. I can wear it anywhere and I wear it obsessively and the quality is so good. It's durable and will last for a long time, which is important to me. And there are lots of little thoughtful design details like adjustable hems if you're changing between flats and heels 
deep pockets, which is awesome when they include pockets for women. And I really appreciate how they take all of the work out of it for me and make it easy to return things if they don't fit. Visit mmlefleur.com slash walkin and use promo code walkin for 15% off your first purchase. That's mmlafleur.com slash walkin and you can get 15% off your first purchase with promo code walkin. You know, we were um, we were talking about the the idea of like, how do you come out of this with a new skill or how do you accomplish something? I was I posted some video today about like the importance of finding an accountability buddy, mm-hmm. which is very much like having a sponsor. Right. So like in yeah. a lot of ways, productivity is kind of like the same mentality. If I said to you, like, Bridget, I'm going to text you after I get done writing today, the chances of me doing that writing go way up, especially if I make it very specific. I say like, I'm going to write 1000 words and I'm going to start at 10 AM and I'm going to be done by 1130. If I haven't texted you by 1130, I want you to check in on me. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like that's a a way that people can actually make some progress. The other cool thing about that is similar to a meeting. A meeting gives you like a starting point for like, I know this is in my day. Right. So I can start to orient stuff around that. Right. I think when we are all given these oceans of time as i said earlier it's it's hard to remember that we need those things yeah. even though they can be annoying right like i knew i was coming here to record with you at a certain time yeah so therefore i needed to be out of bed interpolated yep. backwards from that to get all of the things i needed to do before that yeah and i think that's where like you and i probably are uniquely built for this Suited. yeah maybe because of your aa background and because of my sports and like all of my life has been figuring out how to self start. Yeah, me too. And so that's, it's all been tricks and like, that's the thing (laughs) I think people need to know it's all fucking tricks. Yeah. It's all a trick. It's not like I wake up every day and I'm like, well, this is going to be great. It's always like, well, I've built this habit, right? Right. So everybody right now should read the Charles Duhigg book and the James clear book. So those are both atomic habits is the James clear book. And the power of habit is the Charles Duhigg book. Okay. I'm also way into um, this book, Deep Work, Mm. um, which is about like how to get deeply into your work. Those should be the three books that everyone reads right now in order to like deal with all. We have a whole list from this podcast of books that get mentioned. Just giving too many books. (laughs) No, Um, that's good. I need, we have have time. (laughs) They all talk about like things like um, habit stacking. Right. right. So like making it so that after you whatever after you eat breakfast for me it's i start every day this you can feel free to fast forward the next two minutes because it's going to be kind of boring no (laughs) i start every day with lemon water hot lemon water i do i use when i'm on my point when i'm on my game that's how my day starts hot lemon water so why not do it every day yeah that's a great question (laughs) paul (laughs) so hot lemon water music on my ipod but not my phone because i don't turn my phone on yet okay while i make breakfast breakfast is done i'm reading the economist during breakfast then i go straight into you know the making my bed whatever uh and then a little bit of exercise because i'm broken down from many years of professional sports Mm -hmm. meditation and then usually i would go straight to a coffee shop to write. Okay. And after that, I would turn on my phone. Wow. Right. So like that's, but I've stacked those habits, not because I'm so gifted <laughs> that I just woke up one day. I was like, let's do this uh, yeah. every day. It was more like this wrenching need to figure out this is what I want my life to look like. Right. How can I actually accomplish that? Right. How can I get somebody who says for a long time, I had a friend who lived in London who wanted to get up every day at five 30 in London time. So he would text me a picture of the clock at 5.30. This is like the Jocko thing. He sure. Said he posts a picture of his 4.30 yeah. a.m. So watch he would, every Yeah, he day. would post a picture of the 5.30 thing. And my I wouldn't turn my phone on until probably like basically noon his time. But when I would turn on my phone, I would text him the number of words that I had written. Oh, that okay. was our trade-off, right? Yeah, so we yeah. had two different habits. Yep. But we had this like deal. And then we would like harangue each other a little bit if we hadn't accomplished it. Mm -hmm. But just the fact that I had that backboard in place started me down this path of like, well, if I can do this, what if I added meditation right after that? Right. Right. So then you start stacking these habits as people, again, smarter than I have talked about. Mm -hmm. And then pretty soon you have this whole routine and you're like, oh shit, I got more done by 830 than I would have gotten done all day five years ago. Yeah. 
That's why the morning meetings for me are really helpful because it, there's that old thing like you want to get something done, ask a busy person right. because they know how to manage time. Mm -hmm. And that when um, Maggie, my cousin who does this podcast with me, she works from home, but she, I think there's a big difference between working from home and being a writer. Yeah. And so I can help people with writing from home in whatever limited ways <laughs> I can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she has to, you know, work a kind of nine to five job, although mm -hmm. there's some flexibility for her. And we did a whole video about tips and people. And then we said, you know, if you have any experience or anything to offer and people offered a really great one, which is that if you are going back to your job after this at mm -hmm. some point, theoretically, mm -hmm. and you listen to a podcast every day on the way to work, don't change that. Mm -hmm. even if you're at home still take that exact same time and try and stay in your oh, routine right. as much as and that's something i would never have yeah, considered that's, you know i i talk and again it's not it's not like i created this out of thin air but that idea of putting on different clothes yeah we talked about that like, ours is I'm put on put on a bra <laughs> we're like we have if i don't put on a bra i'm <laughs> right, fucked right that's, the rest yeah, of the day. Saturday only for no bra. And just moving, you know, she has a studio. So for her, mm -hmm. she's like, get out of bed. Right. Get out of bed and like get to the couch or get to yeah, your I mean, dedicated workspace. People talk about like if you walk through a door, there's sometimes the reason we forget why we came into a room is because going through a door like physically puts us in a new space. And right. we can be like, I don't even remember what I was thinking about back there, <laughs> right. right? But that can work to our advantage in that like in that room, I was thinking about bed and my hot boyfriend. Right. And in this room, I'm thinking about, I got to accomplish this form or whatever else yeah. it is. And I don't have kids and I'm not trying to homeschool kids now too. So right. I'm really interested in hearing from people who have children. And, you know, it's funny because homeschooling moms are like, I got you. Right. You know, they've got all the tips and tricks mm -hmm. and, it's just funny how, to see how people are. That's the beauty and the the blessing of this is seeing. I'm like, no one's coming. That's just my mm -hmm. default is no one's coming to save you. No one's coming to save us. Not the government, not corporations. Right. But I am seeing people saving each other mm -hmm. and like people giving their friends loans and floater loans. And Yashar started that whole thing for the wait staff industry where you donate money. Mm -hmm. And he's raised like over $200,000 for grants for people who are in the, like that industry. Oh, nice. And you know, Whitney Cummings donated like big people are matching the donations and helping out. So I'm seeing individuals helping other individuals. And that is, inspiring to see and then just seeing how people how quickly humans adapt to oh, yeah. these circumstances my roommate was showing me they're doing it's a comedy show on instagram where they you know it's you have the like double screen for mm -hmm. live and then they book comedians and oh. it's so weird because there's no laughing but mm -hmm. they get up and they do their five minutes and right. then they go to another comedian somewhere else so i think it's just interesting to see how quickly we're all adapting to this oh yeah but I do think this is where someone like you or someone like me can step up and be of service because I've build, always had to build my own schedule and build my own life. And right. I've been a self starter forever. So mm -hmm. I've never really had, I waitress. The scariest thing for me is that my backup plan was always, well, I can always go back to waitressing oh, forever. Right. Mm -hmm. That was just plan B. And now I'm like, ooh. <laughs> So much for that idea. <laughs> right. I don't know. What, how, that's a great question. You just gave me a little panic attack. Like, what is my backup? Plan? Hmm. I don't know. I guess I could, like, no, I was going to say I could coach basketball, but I've already forgotten. All I of those think things. though, your I I mean, part of it is just having that leap of taking that leap of faith and. As much as people are struggling and losing their jobs and things are bad and they might be panicked, I think there is enough disposable income that people are saving from not going out, you mm -hmm. know, and not like my fetacy.com is the price of a latte, you mm -hmm. know, to join for a month. And it, like we were saying, we started out with it's weird when you create something and then it saves you. I had mm -hmm. no idea how much I would need a gated community of people positively posting wholesome content like bread recipes and they're <laughs> cooking and chairs that they're remodeling and mm -hmm. helping each other on their weight goals. That oh, was yeah. just so cool in general, but now it's like a necessity. Yeah, well, so one thing that 
you know, at, at writer's block on the, in the online portion tonight and people will, will have, this will already have passed by the time that they hear this, but we're doing a reading party. Oh, cool. So people are going to read for an hour. We're going to have them bring a drink, which doesn't have to be booze. Yeah. And have them just post a picture of the book and what they're drinking. Oh, right? that's really cool. We're hosting this guy um, this week named Eric Nussbaum, who wrote a book about the LA Dodgers. He's now stuck in Seattle. He was supposed to be here, but we're going to have him do a reading on our service, right? Which in some ways is actually better than going to a live reading. Cause if I sit in an audience, I don't want to hear a grown man read to me, right. but if it's just in my headphones, I might actually listen to that. Right. And interestingly, people will probably buy more books when they just have to click on it as if, as opposed to if they had to go up to him and like hand them a I book know. and a credit card. So in a lot of ways it causes adaptation that can be better. Right. Right. We're doing a uh, Thursday night table read where we will have people just read parts of a pilot and then we will say, now go watch those 10 minutes and we'll come back and talk about it. In some ways that's more effective online than it is Definitely. in person. Yeah. Right? So like it is interesting that we have to all, no, we don't have to, but it, it, it's nice for all of us to think of these things as opportunities to push ourselves to adapt. Because like we talk about in, in productivity stuff, constraints are the mother of any kind of art mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. when i was when i came out here the first time to make a tv pilot we had a lion producer of course he's in charge of the money and we spent a lot of money making this pilot it was like in the single camera era so we ended up spending three and a half million dollars wow. making a 22 minute pilot which Whoa. is absurd yeah and i remember being like well, well couldn't we just spend a little more on this thing and he's like dude no there's there comes a time where you have to say that's it right and he said the best stuff I've ever seen made stuck closely to its budget because it forced people to think, how can I do this? And that once you start engaging your brain in that way, you actually are better than if you had infinite time. Right. Which kind of comes back to this idea of productivity in that we all seemingly have infinite time right now. So it's all about constraining that in some way, whether that's artificial or it's our husband telling us, like, you have to stop at this time. Right, right. That's been somewhat of an issue. <laughs> <laughs> For you personally? <laughs> Just, I always, I have a very unhealthy phone life balance because so much of my life is it, work is in my phone. Oh. And it's easy for me to justify to myself mm -hmm. that eight hours on Twitter is work. Right. I'm just getting a temperature of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what's going on in the discourse. And it's right. like, no, yeah. you're not. Yeah, you know? that's what, whenever I tell people about like leaving my phone off at night, their first response is always like, but what if something happens? <laughs> and then if you push them a little bit, you get them to realize like, oh, I can't do anything even if it does happen. I've been trying to do the golden silence. When I was at this mm. ashram in New Zealand, they had what was called the golden silence, which was you didn't speak from after dinner until after breakfast. Oh, nice. so you never, it was basically eight to eight. Mm -hmm. So you woke up at six and you meditated and chanted and then went to breakfast and then you were allowed to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And from after when you ate dinner, you were allowed to talk during dinner and then nothing once you started getting ready for bed. And it was powerful and it was amazing. And I was, I think I was there for like four days, but by day four, my friend and I were going crazy. <laughs> But I've been trying to instill the digital version of that. And, mm -hmm. you know, I had Adam Alter on here and he wrote Irresistible and talks a lot about screen addiction. And the mm -hmm. worst thing you can do is have your phone next to your bed at right. night in right. your room. And I've been trying to do that, like shut it down at night and not turn it on until after I do a certain a few things in the morning. And I did it two nights in a row. And then nice. last night I failed. Oh. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's so because I, think, I couldn't sleep, well, and then I was just restless, and so I was trying to read, and so then I couldn't focus on the book. And so let's push in a in a habit training way, right? So they say that there's I ended there's up journaling conflicting for the record. Evidence. Okay, good. There's conflicting information on like, is it you need to do it for whatever thirty five days or fifty two days or whatever it is? But you were talking about like in the first days of A and A of A uh, of like, like AA, sobriety, of just yeah. Like that it requires gutting it out. Yeah. And so that's what I think is interesting about now when it comes to like. So I'm. You're day saying four. basically I should do ninety and ninety. <laughs> well, when it comes to like day four, day five, day six, everybody starts out some madness like we're in. 
Like, well, this is going to be I know. different, right? I know. I'm going to set up these habits. The hard part is that day four, day five, day six, when it gets hard and people are like, it's hard. And what I think would be helpful is if we all admitted that it was hard. Yeah. And then that's where you, if you can build in some of that accountability to just get you through it, because once the habit is built, you it's not hard anymore, right? right? Like so just it's, to be inflexible about it. Yeah. So you, I think it's interesting that people don't, they haven't yet made the leap to like, there's going to come a time when this will be easy, but it's going to be hard right now. Right. It's easy at the beginning and it's easy at the end. In the middle, it's really, really difficult. And we were talking about this on the Phetasy community today. Uh, somebody said something that was so insightful just about food because there's so much kind of food stuff. And, and he was mentioning, like he knows a lot of people in addiction recovery and it occurs to me that there's a fine line between accepting, oh, fuck it, it's just cake, and oh, fuck it, it's just one beer for many during this extremely stressful time. Mm, yeah. Pay attention to the balance of blowing off some steam and giving up. And I was yeah. like, that's, even with food, I'm like, oh, what's five brownies? It's the end of the <laughs> world and I can't drink. Right. And it's the well, same mentality. I think, yeah, that the unfortunate truth is like with more freedom be comes more need for these constraints right. actually like un unfortunately it sounds really great to have like pure the pure bliss of of all this time oh yeah but in a lot of ways that's the exact opposite of what you need if you want to be productive so therefore you actually have to put more rules in than when you had a job i think right. people like again you and i have seen this our whole lives and i've seen it even in my own life like when a season would end when a basketball season would end i'd be like oh my god this is gonna be so fun <laughs> yeah. and then you quickly realize like oh no now i'm depressed because i have too much time to think mm -hmm. so in some ways it probably is the time now where you're like shit i gotta commit to seven to eight is reading eight to nine is i'm gonna yeah. take up a new language nine to ten is working out like that's the only way to get through it it's not just that that's a better way yeah that might be the only way to that's stay interesting sane. um i was saying on one hand thank you know i'm like oh god i can't imagine having kids but then my friends with kids are like thank god i have kids they give oh, me something yeah. to do right and they're you know it's some uh, yes i'm trapped with them and sometimes it's a pain but they're like, how do you, what do you do all day with no kids? You know, they're <laughs> right. like, what is, they're like, yeah, well, that's, you know. I mean, like that's, you know, you were talking about, I don't want to be too, uh, I don't know what the right word is, hokey, but one thing that changed in my life after basketball, basketball was very much about me. Mm -hmm. It was like, I'm going to be better at this thing. It mm -hmm. wasn't so much about like getting to play it in front of people. That was kind of cool. It was more just like. I want to see how good I can get at this thing. Right. Once that ended, I realized like, oh, that's pretty selfish. So it is it is really nice to feel like I'm giving. Right. right? So like at Writer's Block, we want it to be a profitable, biz profitable business, of course, but it means so much to me to be able to pay my workers, to be right. able to have somebody come in and the light go on and they're like, oh my God, I got more done today than I've gotten done in three months. Right. And that's true even online, right? Like if we're able to help people build these blocks into their day, and along the way, I'm also getting to pay my workers still. Like, how amazing is that? So it is, I actually feel in a way like I have children, but the children right. are the business kind of amorphously. Like, it's both my employees and my members slash customers. Yeah. That sense as we age of like wanting to be of service, wanting to give something to people. Yeah. And that's what gets me really fired up about the writer's block stuff is like getting people to see like, oh, it's not that hard. I can, I can actually write something. We don't care if it gets published someday or whatever. We just care about like, you're going to feel better because you're actually doing this writing in the same way that we all feel better when we go to therapy. You felt better when you did that meeting today. Yeah. Like all of those things help us just to feel better and more connected. In that day. In that day. Yeah. That's all we need. <laughs> just we get have. through today being yep. connected. Cause like, yeah, something like this demonstrates to us that those are not infinite. It re it makes you realize how little you need to. Because I'm like, yeah. what have I been chasing? You right. know, what am I what am I doing with all this? This is because I always go to Joshua Tree and my schedule is so blissful, and I mm -hmm. actually have a schedule when I'm there. Oh, and I'm yeah. like, why can't I rub? I wake up for sunrise. I go to the park, mm -hmm. go for a walk, watch the sunrise, come back, write until noon, eat some lunch, lay by the pool and read write another session and then go back into the park for sunset, mm -hmm. come home, make dinner and go to bed and repeat day after day after day. Right. I can't, for some reason here, I'm all over the place. I'm like doing this and that. And do you think, so is that, that's probably back to what we were talking about before, which is that we have convinced ourselves that there's something more well, when in reality, 
there's not that much. No. But that's enough. And I'm now in my Joshua Tree schedule pretty much here. Mm -hmm. So this is, I'm like, oh, this is great. And like the mm -hmm. no traffic in LA, like I will take Apocalypse LA forever if, the, uh -huh. <laughs> if this is a thing. <laughs> it is kind of miraculous. We're all going to get a little too used to the no traffic in this city. And that's it's going to be yeah, a rude awakening when we're back up and running. We have um, three questions since you I posted on the Phetasy community that you were here. For those that occasionally write, what is the best way to have it reviewed for advice or potential publishing? Mm, the advice there is don't worry about that. It's, okay. I think it's so much about figuring out what makes you happy about it in the day to day mm -hmm. because this isn't negative, right? It, the chances of you getting anything published are so slim that to to do it just because you might get published is a non-starter. Right. right. Like it, it's sort of like how when I first started playing basketball when I was 12, I did it because it felt so good to go outside and feel that sense of like the ball just going through the net. Right. Right. I wasn't like someday – I'm going to play for the Phoenix Suns. Right, Now, right. that's in the back of your head as you start to get better. You're like, oh, this would be cool to get to do this professionally. I think that's actually one of the weird misconceptions about writing these days because there are so many stories of like the J.K. Rowlings. Of the right, world, right, right. Of like, well, she was just holed away for years and years and years. I think it has to be that it's fun for you and not just because somebody else said you're a good writer, because you feel better at the end of it. I talk a lot about like, building in that little reward at the end of your writing session, mm -hmm. even if that reward is just you taking four minutes to realize like while you put on some trashy song or whatever, I did something I care about and that's enough. Right. And then if you string a bunch of those together and you happen to be well read and, and you get great editors and some feedback, then maybe someday it gets published or you make a screenplay that is on the big screen. Do people review the work for each other at writer's block? Is we have a very controlled way to do that. I think okay. getting very good editing is important. Or that feedback. Can be, yeah, yeah. That can be a matter of like, again, creating that accountability of a buddy. Right. So somebody else who wants to, again, at writer's block, we have a, a protocol for like how we do feedback. Right. I think when you're just getting started, you don't need that. But what you need is somebody else who's going through what you're going through. Right. And you can just be like, hey, so I just want to get a second draft done. Would you read it if I do that? Right. And that gives you that backstop. That's great. Do your do your different writings have their own personalities different than your own? If so, why do you think? Meaning like Oh, that's interesting. My personal writing? Or? I think I do your different writings have their own personalities different than your own. Hmm. I mean, for me, I would interpret that as does my stand up comedy have its own different personality from like the culture writing I do mm. versus like the mm. scripts that I write versus a book. Right. But I don't think they're that different from me. I, I think it's impossible. Yeah. Even if I wrote like this extreme character, it's still coming out of my brain. Yeah. I think f for me, it's when I switch to fiction, I'm trying to create characters who are like a thread of a personality right or like you know this person is this is the uh for lack of a better term this is the dumb character or right. this is the like vain character and so there's a part of me that's dumb and a part of me that's vain right and when i'm writing fiction as a narrator of that i'm trying to stay out of the way mm. so that the characters can exist when i'm writing nonfiction, that's usually very personal i'm probably a big part of the story right so for me that has been actually a learning process in making the switch from nonfiction to fiction when I'm writing fic or when I'm writing nonfiction, I need you to get into like who I am. Right. So that you can understand my take on whatever the subject is. With fiction, you don't need to know who I am as the narrator. You just need to know who the character is. Right. That's interesting. Uh, a question for both of you. What's the value of all the stuff you write that you cut, dispose of, never complete, or publish? Is there value in it? Ooh, what do you think? I mean, yeah. Of course. I <laughs> I can't tell you how many seeds of things that I cut ended up pieces later. Yeah. And how many things I've repurposed and how many things have got me work that like a pilot that I wrote got me a manager. 
Now, will that pilot ever get made? Who knows? Mm -hmm. Will I turn it into a science fiction novel? Maybe. You right. know, it's a, I think that the stuff, when, when I used to write the column for Playboy, there would be stuff that was hilarious, mm -hmm. but in a more serious or advice column with so much left to interpretation by the reader, mm -hmm. my editor was brilliant and he would always be like, save it for the stage. Like right. you can say this on stage in a tone and people will know, but reading it, it mm -hmm. will come across forever mm -hmm. in a way that might not be accurate or the way that you intended it. So a lot of stuff that got cut out of my columns ended up as stand up material. Mm -hmm. A lot of, there was one great a friend of mine, we used to trade scripts together and I would have these wordy descriptions in, in between. Mm -hmm. And I had never written a movie. And he would always, he had a, I guess he had a professor at college that would write S I F Y S I. Basically, it was like, save it for your fucking novel. <laughs> you know? Like, right. So he would always put that acronym mm -hmm. just like by any time when I was like, and the blue shirt, you know, right. he's wearing the blue shirt and he came in looking dapper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and again, for me, it's just the process. Yesterday, I sat down and I had an editor who wanted me to write. He saw me tweeting and I have editors who will see me rage tweeting and basically I'm lucky this way. Mm -hmm. And they'll be like, hey, want to <laughs> like we'd love that take. And I was so mad that I know I can't write anything in that mm -hmm. space that I would necessarily want out forever. And I just ended up writing like short bursts of everything that I was mad at. Mm -hmm. And it's totally disjointed and insane but now that I look at it, I'm like, okay, I yeah, could maybe do. turn a reasonable, not reasonable, but there's something here that I could turn. But yesterday I was like, this is garbage and it's nothing. So I think the process is really the most important. And even if I never use it, I mean, I say I don't write, but I write in my journal all the time. And I write on fetacy.com all the time. And, mm -hmm. I, and a lot of that stuff just goes out and never goes anywhere. Yeah, I, I do think that there's obviously value, like you said, in all of the fragments that may end up coming back someday. But also, like you said, it's so much more about creating the conditions so that you can create. Yeah. Uh, so like <laughs> in the same way that when I, if if you charted number of hours that I ever played basketball versus the number of hours that anyone saw me play basketball. Right. right? It's a tiny, tiny fraction. So like right. probably on the order of a tenth of a percent or something. And I think writing is very similar. You're just doing the practice of like, oh Jesus, I just figured out how to like attribute uh, dialogue to a character. I'm glad <laughs> nobody knew that I didn't know how to do <laughs> right, that. Right, now, right, right. Like, so there, just like when I, I remember as a kid, I, when I figured out that I grew up near Topeka, Kansas, I figured out that there was this league of this sort of not underground, but the league that nobody knew about. It wasn't the YMCA league. It was this other thing. Right. And I was, I went up to this guy named Lloyd Murphy, who my dad knew. Mm -hmm. I was like, Hey, so I want to play in this league. And he's like, all right, let me get your phone number. And he put me on this team. It's one white kid and 11 black guys. First practice I go to every shot I took got blocked. Right? Wow. <clears throat> and, Throughout that summer, I was the laughing stock of that whole situation. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and I remember vividly that at some point there was a practice where we did like right handed layups and left handed layups. And I had to basically admit I didn't know how to do a left handed layup. Mm -hmm. So I went home and I spent like three hours figuring out how to do a left handed layup so that I could go back and in this practice, which wasn't even a game, not be completely embarrassed because right. now I know how to do a left handed layup. Right. And I think that the writing process is figuring out how do I love that process of learning how to make the left handed layup, not playing in the NBA slash right. publishing a book. Right. Just figuring out like, I feel so good because today I figured out how to shoot a left-handed layup. I don't give a shit if you ever read it or get to see it. Yeah. What matters to me is I loved that moment and then maybe, maybe someday something comes of it. Yeah, I feel lucky. This is one area where I feel very lucky is in that I don't have a choice about writing. Mm -hmm. I don't, it is how I process the world and often I don't know what I'm thinking until I write about it. Mm -hmm. And it was so, I had been writing for so many years before I even realized that that was something I could be mm -hmm. because it was something that I just had to do. Like 
breathing. So I feel... Well, yeah, I do think that we all have to, if we are writerly... I was in touch with um, Megan Daum, who you know yep. also, and uh, and she had just written She's something. She's been on. I know. Yeah. She had just written something about her own sort of near-death experience with a with a virus 10 years ago, right? Ah. Uh. And she's one of those people that you can tell is making sense of how her brain works as she's writing, yeah. which is was always true of me too. A lot of the time when I was processing my basketball career, because it was so strange, yep. the only way I could figure it out was by writing it down. Yeah. Again, I think that connection to this makes me feel better is so much more important than I might get a book deal someday. Yeah, yeah. Like if you can just figure out like, oh shit, I'm much more tolerable when I've written. Oh yeah. <laughs> I I was like, why do I feel insane? And I'm like, oh, I haven't written in two days. That's why. Yeah. And this is an insane time and I haven't taken any mm-hmm. moment to sit down and process yeah, it. Yeah. And so for some people, they may feel insane if they don't paint. Right. Or sculpt or play basketball or whatever it is. It's just identifying what's that thing and and detaching from I'm gonna become famous for this. Right. Just identifying this makes me feel better. I'm gonna keep doing it. It's productive as opposed to like you could be like, Well, I feel insane unless I sniff glue. Maybe we get <laughs> in the way of that habit and instead encourage Another the sculpting. One. Well, that was that that's the hardest thing too, because I had an artist friend and he is uh does you know New Yorker covers and is brilliant and insanely disciplined because he was a self starter, and I was trying to be a writer and always like and he's like someday Bridget you're you're you'll turn your muse into a mule and I did not understand that until I started getting paid to do what I love doing mm-hmm. and had to do, mm-hmm. and then suddenly I was like, <laughs> so that's where. That's been the hard thing for me is this thing that I did all the time just for fun. Mm -hmm. Now it is a dream to be able to get paid for it, but then I have to attach discipline to this thing to do it when I don't want to do it or finish a piece by a deadline. And suddenly I'm like, Mm -hmm. "Uh, you got to whip that mule Mm -hmm. to work. That was, that was, I think true for basketball and hard for people to understand because anytime I would, complain about it because it was fucking hard yeah it's no lonely, professional athletes and like ugh. it's you're you're always self-starting nobody gives a shit yeah. if you're on their team or not they'll send you down the road in a second but anytime i would talk about that people would be like you ungrateful bastard because they don't see that it's not like high school basketball was for them where it's just like oh whatever i'm with my friends and it's fun right and i think that's the same kind of transition you're talking about where you realize like, oh no, people expect something of me. <laughs> I have to figure out how I can have some joy within this, but also show up every day. And I still feel like a piece of shit 90% of the time because I see how hard it is for writers. Mm-hmm. I see how like people who are out there pitching and all the and I'm like, it, it's just, it's not okay. I'm, it's not okay. I should be so much more disciplined and, and, um, yeah, I, I'm lazy. <laughs> like, I'm so fucking lazy. I could write something every day probably, mm-hmm. and I'm just lazy. It's S- unacceptable. Somebody, it is one, un- of these, one of these habits guys I, I was talking about earlier would, would have you reframe that. A lot of times people will say, I'm a procrastinator, right? Mm-hmm. So if we're realistic, you're not lazy. Right, but Probably. I know we've well, talked about this. But Our like, first thing was where you were like, "But what so are I'm, you what I'm saying, at? what I'm like saying 10%. is, I'm saying that you're, uh, yeah, we did. <laughs> so I'm saying that you're not a lazy person. You're a highly motivated person who sometimes trips up. Mm-hmm. There's a way if we frame ourselves. A lot of times this happens with procrastination. People will say, "I'm a procrastinator," and then you're like, "Well, do you like with everything?" And they're like, "No, no, it's a separate one or two things." So let's talk about how can we get you to think of it as. You know what? I usually get things done, but I had a bad afternoon and I put off some shit, right? And then you're able to be like, if you start to think of yourself in a way of like, I'm a highly made, motivated person, but I got drunk last night and I'm hungover today, right? Right. And I, that doesn't mean that it's a trend. It's just, I had a bad day. That can help us to all, I think, move forward. On. That's interesting. I have this even with invoicing. I'm, mm. I, but this is a scarcity problem from being freelance forever. So yeah. I I probably have at any given moment a thousand dollars that people owe me for writing out mm-hmm. just uh, that I could charge people for and I don't 
But for me, it's like, well, I have that thousand dollars. It's oh, like a yeah. savings. Right. It's so weird. <laughs> and I don't need to think like that anymore. And right. it's just this scarcity mentality. Like mm-hmm. editors will be like, Bridget, can you invoice? You know, we mm-hmm. owe you money. And I'm like, mm. I'll get, I'm worried that shit's going to go sideways. And then I'll be like, well, I have a thousand dollars coming to me. Somewhere out there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Last question. And then we'll wrap it up. Similar. Uh, we had Gigi uh, Lavangi on here. She was great. She just wrote her like fifth novel. And he said, similar questions to Gigi. What advice do you have for new authors? Um, I, th- I think it is that I was so lucky to have, like you said, uh, a quasi deadline Mm -hmm. and feedback. My first writing experience was being in Greece and being completely baffled by the world I was in and sending out emails to friends and family, right? Right. Of like, here's what's happening. If they responded, then I knew I had connected in some way. As I went, I realized if I made these emails funny, then people would respond to them more quickly. And that was like a interesting little Petri dish. So my advice is to figure out what's your Petri dish. Right. Like what is your feedback loop? Whether that is just like we were saying earlier, um, I feel good about this and I'm just going to plug away at it day after day. Or if you're writing more like personal essay or online stuff, what's a community you can create that might only be 10 people. Yeah. But you can post that and people will give you some sense of like you're doing this in a way that I like or it's too long or... We Whatever. have this on Fetacy, actually. So oh. I had a daily writing prompt, mm-hmm. which I quick abandoned long mm-hmm. ago, but the good citizens of Fetacy have continued it. And oh, nice. so a lot of them are still doing the daily writing prompt. And they, you know, it's like, it's a cool, it's always a cool experience. And they all share it. And mm-hmm. the stuff people write is amazing. And yeah, we have a lot of writers in there that are, but I think that's a great place to, to, you have to kind of find a safe space. Yeah, and and I think it sometimes there's this romanticization of like I'm going to write a novel from scratch. Right. And that's tough, right? Yeah, like if yeah. you've never written anything, I would I would really recommend people start with like just write about your day or like you're saying, use yeah. a writing prompt and put it in a community. There is you know, like I was watching um The Outsider the other night the HBO show uh-huh. and I think Dennis Lehane or however you say his name had written one of the episodes and he's he's an author like there's a, there's all these evidences of or instances sorry evidences there's all these instances of like people you find out were novelists but they also wrote a ton of nonfiction and they also gave talks or right. whatever else like you don't have to just be a novelist you could start by writing a little personal essay about your experience right. in covid19 and Which then there's going to be an overwhelming amount of. Yes, there will. <laughs> but if there are five people who read that and they're like, you know what? I kind of feel that way too. Then that gets you to write again the next day, mm-hmm. whatever that mm-hmm. thing is. And yeah. then eventually you get to, like we were talking about earlier, creating this practice that feels good. But at the very beginning, I think it just has to be fun. Yeah. Cousin Maggie, Maggie's writing a novel and Mm -hmm. it's her first and she's diligent and amazing, but it's a fantasy novel. So she has Mm. to create a magic system. (laughs) She's like, yeah, yeah, she's watching. And there's so many resources. I mean, she took this whole course online. She went Mm. down this rabbit hole of magic systems and all these authors talking about their magic systems. And Mm -hmm. I'm like, my God, (laughs) this sounds like I'm just gonna write a book about how I accidentally became a pundit. <laughs> right. That's well. That's. I mean, there, there's. I think there is a lot of value in like, what do you know best? Right. A lot of us know ourselves pretty well. Right. So like, write about that at the start, and then you realize like, you, if you're writing a fantasy novel, it ain't just like, and then it started with it's setting up a system. I it's mean, like all it's of the, crazy. Everything that yeah. goes into that. Well, thank you so much for coming by again. In, of course, I'm in the honored to be here. Age of coronavirus, mm-hmm. and where? So, where can people? Um, I'm going to start doing the sprints online. Yeah, good. And I'll convince a lot of people in my community to come with me. Right. And we, where uh, can they sign up? So they can. You're going to provide them with a link at okay. some point, and they can use the coupon code uh, Walk In to okay. take twenty percent off. Oh, great! Each month, it starts out. Uh, the first two weeks are free, so people can just see if it works for them. Okay. Um, all of this happens at writersblock.org slash online. But again, you're going to provide people in your community with a link. Okay, great. Uh, and uh, again, that coupon code is walk-in. 
And if you're not in my community and you're listening to this, uh, I you will can still use that coupon code. <laughs> yeah, but use you can that yeah. So code. you can tweet out a, a link. And okay. all of that. But uh, yeah, I think it's um, it's off to a really cool start. And I think what's really valuable about it is not only the accountability, but also that sense of I'm not alone. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. I'm out here in wherever in Meriden, Kansas, where I'm from. And I've always wanted to just write a little bit. So why not jump in and get going and yeah. we'll hold your, your feet to the fire? And we also report people's data back to them at the end of the week. So we'll say like, Bridget, this week you accomplished whatever, 4,500 cool. words. Maybe I will write this proposal. You know what I think it is for me, the proposal? I think I have to just write two chapters. Yeah. It's it's like, forget all the other... Mm. I'm getting trip, tripped up on all the other stuff. Oh, you're, when, so you're stuck on the proposal, but not the content? Yeah. Yeah, you got to write the content, and then you'll be able to write the proposal about what the content yeah, yeah. is. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm realizing this. Because I mm. started writing the intro chapter, and it was like, just poured out of me. Mm -hmm. So I think that I've just been getting in my own hung way. Up, yeah. yeah, just hung up. Like, the bio hung me up for like a year. I'm like, <laughs> I, I can't write this. <laughs> And where can we find you online? On Twitter, I'm at Paul then Shirley, which is just to take off on the fact that I don't like to be called by my last name first. Okay. Uh, and then... Uh, That's from all those years of sports. Yeah. Anytime <laughs> somebody calls you by your last name, they're mad at you. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody's ever like, Shirley, yeah. I'd like to tell you, you look great today. That means a lot of people are mad at me because they always they just call say, me Fattacy. Really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're like, Fattacy. Um, And then I'm the same on Instagram if anybody needs to find me, at Paul then Shirley. I would also put a plug in for um, my little brother who oh, uh, yeah. makes charts that are great. He's, he's hilarious. He's Shirley charts. Uh, he's a much bigger deal on Instagram than I am. He's <laughs> okay. Gonna, he's going to create more content that you're interested in on Instagram That's than, true. than my pictures of me and my mom. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for coming by. Thank you for having me. It's really fun to talk about yeah. this stuff. Yeah. I'd like to thank our sponsor, M.M. LaFleur. M.M. LaFleur is a wardrobe solution for professional women. It creates luxury apparel and accessories with the same attention to detail as high-end fashion houses. Right now, if you visit mmlafleur.com slash walkin and use promo code walkin, you'll get 15% off your first purchase. That's mmlafleur.com slash walkin and you can get 15% off your first purchase with promo code walkin. Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank Ricochet, our composer Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> it's the dumbest line. <laughs>